iagm.org. That's the website, iagm.org. And you can see these and look at all the missionaries there. Um, also, you go to the IAGM um, Facebook page, and they will you'll find weekly blurbs there where people, like missionaries, are um, featured there on a weekly basis. And, and so you can learn a lot about them there too. I go go there, and I recommend if you're not don't visit the fi- Facebook page. Go there because you'll get w- updates at w- numerous times during the week on the different missionaries featuring them, and then share it, share it on your Facebook, get the word out what's going on around there. That's I started doing that this week and stuff like that with some of our missionaries. Now, those are y- you, those of you who know me um, know that I'm not one to like to brag about stuff. Um, and boast, and I'm, I'm pretty, pretty humble, uh, really, when it com- comes down to it. I, why are people shaking their heads like this? Is I mean, I just really, I am. I'm very humble, and, and um, but I do have to every now and then. You know, you reach a certain place in life where you're esteemed, and you get things other people might not have, and you just want to share with them the hope that maybe someday you'll be able to achieve such a level of status as I have achieved in my life because I have right here sent to me by somebody I don't know an ice cream scoop with my Kelly's name on it. (laughs) Now does anyone here have an ice cream scoop with your name on it? (laughs) I didn't think so. So so that's that's why I'm sharing this with you because I I wanted to um, um, just have you rejoice with me uh, at at this amazing prosperity that has found me once again. All right. (laughs) With that said, we'll be in Romans chapter 8, um, verses 18 through 25. I was excited as we go through Romans, I try to pick out certain passages um, where they have, um, let me turn my mics on to this, um, where, where it, um, the, the thought is complete, in other words, because it, it, the thoughts sometimes will they'll blend into each other. But, but Paul took a little bit of mini, just sidebar here, in Romans 8, verses 18 through 25, and talked about a subject that if you've been part of our church over the last 10 years, you know that it's become one of my favorite themes, and I would say is my favorite theme, is the theme of heaven. And um, because he talks about the eternal sphere here, um, excuse me, is the end game of our gospel. And, um, And our text today warrants me to once again focus on the truth of heaven and the hope that heaven is indeed real. I'm not quoting the book's title. And God's kids, you and I, are going there. Um, I thought Nina's commentary and thoughts on heaven were really beautiful from the Ukraine. And, and I can imagine when you have bombs going overhead, you think quite a bit about you know, heaven and what happens if I, when I die. And I, as a preacher, I've, been, I've thought about it. I've, I've been doing this for um, numerous decades. And, and, um, and, but it but didn't become, I would say, real to me till I had people there that I really, really missed and, and um, was desperate to go there. And it has become um, the theme, really, of, I think, my ministry, for me, anyway. Now, in 2012, I did 10 messages on heaven after the loss of Ihana, and, um, and they're still on the YouTube channel. You can see them. We talked about anything imaginable that had to do with heaven. We brought it up and we searched the scriptures much deeper than I had done probably in any other subject. Um, and, and so we are on our YouTube channel, we have about 15 um, messages that I've done in the last 10 years on heaven. So you can find those, and it gets much more elaborate than what we're going to cover today. Um, then in the last... Um, 11 years, I've done over 100 memorial services. And within those 100 memorial services, some of the folks I, you know and I know, um, and, and, but in those 100, I probably spoke on heaven about 90 of them. It comes to a place where outside of making it personal for the folks, I have the same message. Now, sometimes I'll be asked to do a funeral for folks I don't know within the church, and and on, I think, three different occasions after I spoke on this theme, I got letters in the mail or people requesting, finding me and requesting me to me, could you, when my mom dies or when this person dies, uh, can you speak on that subject at their funeral? Because it just gave them so much hope. And, you know, it was intended to. 
and he was intended to give us hope. So the message really has three parts to it. I want to impart hope. This isn't all there is. Thank God, right? This isn't all there is. Um, The Christian will never taste death. We just literally go from one realm to another. There's no cessation of life. Once our life ends here, it starts there. The next breath, half a breath, quarter of a breath, it starts there. Um, I want to educate us on what is heaven really like. I got asked questions this week about what is heaven really like? What about the people who've gone on before me? Um, Will they know me in heaven? Will I have relationship with heaven? Well, we want to talk about some of those things. And I want, the third part of this message, I want to inspire us to view this life that we're living right here on earth from the top down. I think it's important. Sometimes I think we view this life from the bottom up. This is what life is. And heaven's something that we just sort of floats around out there. But when all of a sudden heaven becomes the theme of our life, it truly is the only hope we have. I mean, is, is there a hope that you're not going to die? No. Is there a hope that you're not suffering's not going to find you? No. Nope. You can you always have hope that God can intervene? Yes. Does God always intervene? No. Does God always heal? No. Does He heal sometimes? Yes. So we trust in the character and nature of God. But one thing that's consistent that never moves is that we have an eternal home. Life was never meant to be. Um, this type of was never meant to replace that. We were made for heaven. And I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me read the verses because I'll get on a rampage in here. <laughs> Verse 18. Yet we, we, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory we will reveal to us later. See, Paul was suffering. His whole ministry was one of suffering. But his gaze was always to a real heaven, a hope of heaven. Now, let me define the word hope one more time for you, biblically speaking. It's not something like, well, geez, I hope that's real. No, it, hope is in the Greek it, it with an understanding that it's going to happen. It's already in the bank. It's just not time for it yet. It's a realistic expectation that it's going to be achieved. That's elpis, uh, or elpis, however you say, um, of, of biblical hope. No, it's not like when we use the illustration, I hope I win the lottery, and I hope I do. I have to play it first, but I hope, but, but, and, um, I hope you win it. And because um, and if it is sin to play the lottery, then you can just tithe, and it will, we'll be guilty. Of, we won't be guilty of anything, but it's nothing. And, um, but there's, but, and I'm not saying it's sin to play the lottery, but it, it's, I, I'm just saying that I don't really think I'm going to win it, but I can, in a biblical hope, I know I'm convinced that this is something that's going to be mine. And Paul's gaze was always upward. We'll see that as we look at some of his other passages. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. God knows who his kids are. He just taught us that. Now let me just take a little sidebar here because this, I think, will make, hopefully bring comfort to some folks. (coughs) Um, Who is saved and who isn't saved? Hmm. I'm going to tell you right now. (laughs) We don't know. God knows the heart. God knows. Can we tell them by their fruits? Yeah, we can can see the evidence of the Holy Spirit in people, but I think if we use that on a religious platform, we look at the um, Pharisees and say, boy, look at that fruit. But they didn't know God but they had a lot of religious practices and they lived their life impeccably and all these. So you can look at that life and say, there's fruit. But no, it wasn't fruit. It was just man-made religion. That's all it was. So let, let's look at this dude right here, right here. Verse on, on Luke 23. One of the criminals hanging beside him, this is Jesus on the cross. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saying to yourself and us, while you're at, by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. So if you're the really Messiah, save yourself. And while you're at it, save us too. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes. Well, this guy's right on the brink here. He's going to be dead soon. But this man, and he knows it, this man hasn't done anything wrong. 
Then he said, to, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Beautiful. This man never went to church. He had no fruit that you can point to. I mean, there's no fruit. He was a criminal. He was dying for his crime. Um, there was, he, didn't, he didn't tithe. <laughs> he didn't live a good life. Um, he, he had a life full of crime. He simply called out to Jesus with a simple heart moments before he died. Moments. Now, if you were his family and, um, and maybe living in other parts of um, Palestine during those days, and you asked that, hey, do you know if such and such, we don't know his name, can, knowing that he was arrested and lived his life this way, you think he went to heaven? Oh, no. He lived an awful life. He did this, he did this, he did this, this. But you know what? The last second before he died, he reached up to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ says, today, because of this one moment, when you reached to me, right before you died, you'll be with me in paradise. We don't know who's, who has not reached out to Jesus Christ. We don't know that last second, those last breaths, the quietness of your heart. I lived in a home um, where I wouldn't say it was a Christian home. It was a good home, a moral home, but not a Christian home. And my dad told a story, and he went to heaven many years ago. He told a story that when, when he had his first re religious experience, and you guessed it, it was in Germany in World War II when he was in a foxhole exposed and he heard... Boom. And then while he heard that noise of the bombs dropping, he begged God to save him. Then he went, he survived, went on to live the rest of his life, raised three wonderful kids, the youngest being better than the other two, <laughs> and, and, um, and, and then retired, and at the end of his life, in the loneliness, my mom had died years before, in the loneliness of his little trailer, um, he just reached out again. And I know when I go to heaven, my dad will be there. Never attended a church. Against his will, all creation will be subject to God's curse, but with eager hope. The creation looks forward to the day when it will jo join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. The verses say it all here. But we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. That was written 2,000 years ago. If they were groaning back then, what's going on now? All creation is screaming? I mean, <laughs> I mean it, was, it was groaning back then. Now it's like they're like out of their minds, all creation, because the world is, is just a, such a peaceful place. And, and verse 23, and, we, and as believers, we groan as even, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, we long for our bodies to be, be released from sin and suffering. We, too, wait for that e with eager hope, strong language, eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights what we were made for, what we were created for, as his adopted children. We spoke about that a few weeks ago, including the new bodies he has promised us. No dieting. New bodies. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need hope for you for finding hope. But we look forward to something we don't have yet. We must wait patiently and confidently. I'm going to share some stories here and some insights to, that I've just gleaned. I'm going to, if you want to see me after church, I'll recommend some really good reading on, on this subject. But I've shared, I've shared some of this stuff many in the many memorial services. But one of the most telling stories I, I read through the years was that of um, Will Moody. It was D.L. Moody's son. D.L. Moody was a famous preacher. Uh, thousands, tens of thousands had come to Christ through him in the 1800s. Um, and when D.L. Moody um, was on his deathbed, he was in, a, in and out of consciousness, as so many are when they're 
on their deathbed. He would come up and sort of perk up and be aware and then sort of go back into a level of um, comatose state. Um, so he woke up from sleep in the morning one day, and Will, his son, was next to him, and he just said clearly and openly, Earth recedes, and heaven opens up before me. His son, who, um, who thought he was sleeping, tried to wake him up. He thought he was just talking in his sleep, in a very clear voice. Um, he got, and, um, so he shook him a little bit, Dad, Dad. And Moody said, No, no, this is no dream, Will. It's beautiful. It's like a trance. If this is death, it is sweet. There's no valley here. And God is calling me, and I must go. <laughs> D.L. Moody's words. He talked like that for a little while, and he went in and out again. And then he sort of perked up and, and said things even clearer. He said, this is my coronation day. I've been looking forward to it for years. <laughs> His face lit up, and he uttered in a joyous way, Irene, Dwight, that's the other family's I'm wife and other family, I see the children's faces. There was his grandkids that had died a few years earlier. And moments later, he was gone. That's D.L. Moody's testimony by his son of his death. He had entered what we have called in our teaching this present heaven. And you can go back on YouTube and see the whole message on that. So let's look what Paul says about this. In 1 Timothy 6, um, verses 12 through 16, fight the good fight for the true faith, holding tightly, I underline that and bold it on purpose, holding tightly to the eternal life which God has called you. Now we know that eternal life starts the moment you're born again and continues forever. Okay? It follows us to heaven. That's what gets us there. <laughs> but it starts here. Which called you, which you have confessed before many witnesses, for at the right time Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and all, only Almighty God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He alone can never die. He lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach him. So it says, hold tightly. Strong language, very strong. It means to grab, seize, think about, access, like. Hold tightly, eternal life. Grab it. Seize it. Think about it. Access it. Like it. Never let it be far from your thoughts. Eternal life. What it means now and what it means forever. Now I'm going to delve into the controversy here. First, first, Kim, not really. First Corinthians 2.9. That's what the scriptures mean when they say the, uh, the eye has, no, has, has seen nor ear heard and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. No mind has imagined it. Now, I know that verse in context really refers to the, transform, the transformational power of the gospel when you read that verse in context, but you cannot exclude the fact it, talks, it means our eternal estate as well. No mind has imagined what God can do in your life now and what God has done for your life later. No mind can, has imagined it. Now, one of the things I learned in my reading in college, it's, um, and I think sometimes depending on your, your, um, our, our makeup, individual makeup, our theological makeup, you know, when God made us with emotions and minds and, and all this intricacy of our humanity, um, one of the things he gave us was an imagination. Kids have a vivid one. I mean, and, um, and I, like, I, like, I have sort of an imagination as well. I still hope to play left field for the Red Sox someday. It's an imagination. But, it's, um, but he gave us one. Um, now, again, it, so it's okay to use your imagination. You just got to make sure your imagination is contained in truth and scripture. And make, if, if it's that fact, God gave this as part of our human faculty. My imagination was not supposed to be squashed. It was supposed to be something that I, I enjoy and allow myself to happen as long as, again, it doesn't violate the context of truth and, and Scripture. So he says, nor has I seen nor even imagined. So it means I can think about heaven. I can imagine about heaven. I don't know what it's like. I, you know, I've never been there yet. I read a few books of people who have. But, but I haven't, but I haven't, I, but can, if eye has not seen nor ear heard, then we know that Paul was ushered into the third heaven, and he says, I, I saw things I can't even utter, I can't even describe. 
So let your imagine fly. Imagine they let it go. I don't know what it's going to be like. Is it going to be like this most beautiful baseball park? Well, my part will be. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Um, but we, so we imagine, we imagine a way, both present and future. So look at what he, look, look what he says here. Since you've been raised to a new life, you have been raised. Um, that's, you know, looking back, first class condition. Since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, he says this, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Paul's exhortation. Where Christ sits in a place of honor on God's right hand. Then he says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you have died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when your life, who is, and when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of His glory. Paul had a lot to say about this subject. It was a driving theme in his life. Set your sights is a it means to seek in order to find out by thinking, meditating. Reasoning, inquiring into. Again, zeteo, Greek word, um, um, powerful word. Then he says, think about the things of heaven. This is the word, I thought it was legizomai, but it's not. It's phreneo. To have a mindset, drink, to, to direct one's mind to a thing or to exercise the mind to a thing. So exercise your mind towards the things of heaven. Lightfoot said, you must not only seek heaven, you must also think heaven. Let your imaginations go. <laughs> it's a clear, diligent, active, single-minded investigation, present tense. Keep actively seeking the realities of heaven. Let it become a driving force in your life. Hebrews eleven sixteen. the patriarchs all were what? They always said they were longing for a better country. They weren't talking about America. They're talking about an eternal home. They're longing for a better country. So we seek it now so we can prepare to live in it later. Now, some aspects, and some of this is, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm just, I'm not an original thinker. I'm a, I'm a good reader, so I use other people's thoughts, and then I, I usually give them credit. Sometimes if I don't think you know who they are, I'll just take the credit. <laughs> but, but, it, but, it's, but you know, only when we really, every time you preach a message, I mean, they have things called commentaries and stuff like that. So we're always reading other people's um, um, stuff and things like that. There, there appears to be an understanding, and I say it appears to be, that those in heaven are at least somewhat aware of what's going on back on earth here. Now, I, what do we base that on? Well, let me, let me read you this verse. This verse little, little, I would say mildly controversial. Therefore, Hebrews 12, 1, reaching back to chapter 11, all the patriarchs of the faith, therefore we are surrounded about by such a huge cloud of witnesses to this life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that does so easily trip us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Now there's different views on this verse. I looked it up in the dozens of commentaries. Uh, some think it's the great cloud of witnesses is referring to the saints of Hebrews um, 11. And I would say that's absolutely undeniably true. It is true. Others say it's the martyrs of the faith. I would say that's probably undeniably true as well. But I also believe it's everyone who's gone on before us in this race called life. Um, just because um, the grace of God is no respecter of people. Henry Alfred said this, you know, an old-time Greek guy. I've been reading them for years. So, the, so he, on this commentary on these verses. So these words must be taken as distinctly so far implying community between the church triumphant and the church below. The church in heaven, the church below. That those who have entered into this heavenly test are conscious of what passes among ourselves here on earth. Any interpretation short of this leaves the exhortation here tame and without point. I think he's a little bit more dogmatic than he can be there. But I, I want to show you that this is a very respected guy that believes that 
they are aware. So this great cloud of witnesses, I won't get into all the words here because it's just theological mumble jumble, but it's pretty fascinating because I read it in so many cases, in so many different um, commentaries. In Revelation chapter 6, the saints of the tribulation period are in heaven and very engaged in what was going on on earth. And I understand in tribulation period, but they were engaged. They were, how long before you avenge us, Lord? They said. So they knew what was going on on earth. And the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah, they knew what was happening on earth. Now, maybe that was a special thing that God said, okay, guys, you go, you're on again. <laughs> Get down there, dear. And, uh, but they were aware. Samuel knew who Saul was up, what, what Saul was up to. When they, the, the, witch, the witch called him back and Samuel came, I like, said, Saul, you know, he knew what he was up to. There's rejoicing in heaven when somebody gets saved, Luke 15. So obviously there's a connection where the people of heaven, the beings of heaven know what's happening on planet earth. Randy Alcorn said this, earth may be ignorant of heaven, but heaven is not ignorant of earth. I always like that quote. Can those, we, can those that we love who are now in heaven see our life as it is at this moment? Can I be dogmatic? They can. No. Can I have a hope and an imagination that they can? Yeah. I, I don't see any reason why I can discount that. I, let me give you a little bit of my own testimony. I haven't, I've shared this numerous places, and, um, but... I don't share this part of it that much. And um, when we lost our daughter um, in February 2012, um, I, I was begging God to speak to me, just begging God to guide me and direct me. <clears throat> and for the next six months, and I was in the Word every day, and for the next six months, he would spoke to me, I could say, honestly, three times. Um, he spoke to me one time in Hebrew, and every time it was just doing my morning Bible reading. That's all I was doing. And then the scriptures would come alive. He spoke to me in Hebrews. Um, well, actually, this time it was my, my daughter's life verses with Hebrews 10, 35, and 36. He had them for different reasons than I have. But in her mind back then at 20 years old, uh, those are her life verses. And they're on her, her grave marker. And so I read those verses a gazillion times. And God spoke to me one day about those verses. I'll tell you that story another time. And then another time in, in August, I remember, I mean, sorry, in, it was July. I remember, it was because when the Spirit of God speaks to you so clearly, you know it's the Spirit of God and you don't forget it. And I remember I'm reading Isaiah 57, verse 1. You can read it yourself, New Living Translation. But God spoke to me at that moment and comforted me about my daughter's death and gave me a different perspective on it. Isaiah 57, verse 1. And, um, and, but then, uh, about a month after that, I'm reading through the book of Hebrews, and I read this verse. And, um, and I'm thinking about the great cloud of witness, and I forget what I was reading along with it that made me think that my daughter might be in that great cloud of witnesses. She could be watching me live this life now. Now, this, is, this, this was important to me because my daughter had a deep love and deep respect for me in life. She loved what I did. She, I, my home life and my public life are one and the same. They're not different, and she knew that. And so she really respected and loved mommy and daddy, and we were very close that way. So I, if she was proud of me in life, and she was, she, I don't think she thought I was capable of a mistake. <laughs> and uh, I was, but I didn't think she was capable. I didn't tell her any different. And um, she and if she was proud of me in life. I wanted her to be proud of me in death. If she is watching my life right now, if she is witnessing me, I don't want to quit. I don't want to throw in the towel. I don't want to dive into sin. No, she's. If she was proud of me in life, I want her. I want her to watch me finish my race, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. So she'll be proud of me in that great cloud of witnesses. That, meant, that verse means a lot to me. And that verse has kept me in the game a lot more than some might want to even think. 
<laughs> now, will we know people in heaven as we did on earth? I believe that's another yes. As we just said, Samuel knew Saul. Um, um, when he came back, Elijah and Moses was recognized. I don't know how uh, the disciples knew what they looked like, but, but, they, were, uh, but they were recognized. Um, we will be ourselves in heaven, whatever that means. Now, all our characteristics and that make us who we are in our uniqueness, sense of humor, personality traits, they all follow us there, at least the good stuff. The stuff that makes us you, because we're all different, aren't we? All our idiosyncrasies and stuff like that, the, the bad stuff stays behind. The good stuff follows us there. So when I go there and see my loved ones, I'll, uh, I'll have that, that unique um, distinctiveness of their personalities. It's going to be them. It's not going to be some angelic robot. It's going to be the stuff that followed us, started on earth. It's going to follow us to heaven. The good stuff, the bad stuff, the anger, the fears, the addictions, that remains in the grave. So I'll know my mom, my granddad, uh, my, my special relationships, my sons, my daughters, my, my dads, my brothers, and my sisters. We'll actually know them better in heaven than we know them here. Our relationship is going to be enhanced and, and quality of it. It's not going to de be diminished in any way. Our past will still be our past. Will we forget it? Well, some say it wipes away memories. But I, I think, and again, I'm, I'm, these are thoughts I get from um, Paul Enns and, and um, Randy Alcorn and others. I, I believe that our personality traits will be there. We'll be able to reminisce of even our relationship on earth. These are those guys talking, not me. I'm not that smart. <laughs> and um, that, so this, this unique relationship that you have with your family and your loved ones, with me and all the people, will still remain a unique relationship. You can look back, celebrate whatever, rejoice. The bad stuff, you, you're, you're living with a beautiful, glorified body with no sin. So the bad stuff stays behind. Maybe you remember that. Maybe you'll have the grace of God because he's going to let Ephesians 2, 7 get glorified as we walk through the streets of gold. Great verse. Genesis 25, verse 8 says, When Abraham died, he was gathered to his people. It says that about a bunch of the patriarchs, that same phrase. In the Hebrew language, means he was reunited with his family that had died before him. His people was his brethren. So he is reunited with them. We all have our people there, don't we? And we have a bunch of our peeps. That's all my peeps in heaven. We have, we have a bunch of peeps we haven't met yet. Granddads, great-granddads, great-great-dads. They're my peeps. There's going to be a Kelly section. It's going to be Irish. And, um, and, and, it's, and they're, they're, I'm going to meet them. They're going to be my people. That's my family. We're, we're, we're connected. We all have our people. Matthew 11, verse 8, um, I'm sorry, Matthew 8, verse 11, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the great um, feast in the millennial, there's granddad, father, and son all eating together, family, all eating together at the feast. They obviously knew each other. Jesus showed us that. Death, this is an important point. I hope this you get blessed by this. Death does not end relationships on earth. It simply delays them so they continue again. Now, I don't think I'll be preaching about much longer. Paul never saw heaven as something to be avoided. It was his um, always deepest desire to go there. And I'm, again, I want to show you another passage that brings this out. In Philippians 1, 20 through 24, New Living. For I, for I fully expect and hope I'll never be ashamed and that I'll continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to God whether I live or die. For me to live, for me, living means living for Christ. And I love this. And dying, that's even better. <laughs> for, for if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better, but I'm torn between the two desires. I long to go and be with Christ. I'd rather die. I'm not clinging on to anything here, that's what Paul's saying. I'm not hanging on to life. I'm not waiting for stuff to change. I'm not waiting for something to get better. I don't want him to get, let me out of prison. I don't, I, I, I'm not looking to, to prosper in any way. I'd rather just die. 
But if I, God doesn't take me, then I, that means I have a purpose and I'm going to be living for you guys. Dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between the two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Here's a guy who had the, um, heaven, a, a divine perspective, a hope of heaven. Now, for those who don't believe in God, and if you're listening on Facebook, please make note of this. You don't believe in God. Life on earth is the best that you got. So enjoy it. Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow you die, then uh-oh. Um, life on earth is the best you have. If, if, if prestige and power and money and security is what you're looking for, then this is the best it's going to get for you. But I can promise you, you're going to go to a funeral someday and say goodbye to somebody you deeply love. And I hope you have a hope bigger than earthly success and physical health or whatever that is. Because you're going to need it. And when you get sick and you get the bad doctor's report and you can't do what you used to do because of age and every joint on your body starts hurting and you realize your day's coming sooner, not later, you realize the things you acquired in life is not going to have zero power and help. Second Timothy 4, 18. Yes, Lord, I will deliver me, and the Lord will deliver me, and I put my own commentary in there. Apo is assured of removal from every evil attack and will bring me safely. Points to a rescue. Paul saw death as being rescued. I'm being rescued into his heavenly kingdom, all glory to God forever and ever. Paul, I'm being rescued. How, how's your, you getting out of jail? You're going to get, you know, you're going to be set free? No, I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm being rescued from life. Woohoo! <laughs> I'm out of here. I'm out of here. God, I can't wait. I'm going to be executed soon. Did you know that? Let's rejoice with me. They're going to chop my head off. Oh, baby can't wait. I'm going to be rescued. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to die. I don't have to deal with you guys anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. That's Paul. He goes, I'm going to be rescued. See, death restores the believer to his created purpose. We we're never meant to be plagued by stress, heartache, grief, loss, um, trauma, fear. We we're created to live in fellowship with God. You've heard me teach on this. I believe in John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus wept at Lazarus' grave. And, he, and depending who you read and stuff, they say he left because he saw everyone's grieving. But, but you know, that doesn't make sense to me because Jesus knew he was going to take Lazarus out of the grave right then. He knew he was coming back to life. He knew all those tears were going to turn into rejoicing in a moment. He knew it. So why would he be weeping over their grief? Because that grief was going to turn into great joy in just a few seconds. I believe he wept because he saw firsthand what death has done to the human race. Because he knew it was never supposed to be that way. Human beings were created to live and have life and never die. So when he saw the grief that, that, that death caused, he wept, and I would say probably, a, and you can see a little earlier um, in that passage, a, a holy anger that the devil had brought death, Hebrews 2.14, into the human race. Death gives us back what we lost. C.S. Lewis said something like this, not an exact quote. When we find ourselves in this life seeking contentment and satisfaction and never finding it, it's because we're, we were made for another world. We will not be ravaged with these fears and inordinate passions, addictions, and loneliness and unmet desires. This is another story, because I always like this one. Sammy Morrison, some of you have heard of him, a famous, famous missionary. Great story. I loved it. He spent years on the mission field, lost his whole family to death on the mission field. Dif difficult um, ministry. I think it was Africa, right, Dr. Lewis? Sammy Morrison? Yeah, Africa. And, he, um, and he's coming home now. He's older. And he's coming home. He's on a ship, obviously, you know, planes back then. And on the same ship as Sammy Morrison is President Theodore Roosevelt, who just went on a hunting trip to Africa and shot 
animals. Um, no one had, he got, off the, he got off the boat, the ship, they put the dock down, and there's a whole band, New York City, the whole band's playing for the president, the banners and the, whatever the song was, and this whole big, the media was all there, just um, celebrating the president's return to America and stuff like that. And Sammy Morrison sh showed up, and the person that was supposed to pick him up never showed up. So we had to call a taxi. I'm not sure they had phones. I'm not even sure how to even get a taxi. So he complained to God. He goes, I'm here alone, God. I spent my life on the mission field, and there's not one person that can greet me when I came home. And then he said, he heard God's voice speak to him. He says, Sam, Sammy, you're not home yet. He's not home yet. This isn't your home. Bill Price said, I travel all over the world. The best part of a trip is going home. Spurgeon said, the world is like an inn, a place to sleep until we get home. <laughs> we all live, my friends, in these dividing, these dissolving family circles. Um, I do, used to do more weddings than funerals. Now I do way more funerals than weddings. Said goodbye to many people, help people say goodbye to many people. Uh, mom's gone, dad's gone, children are gone, husband, wife is gone, grandparents are gone, close friend is gone. But as you know the, how the saying goes, but the circle is unbroken in heaven. There's no one gone in heaven. It's forever and ever. There is no death, crying, sorrow, or pain. Revelation 21 teaches that. For these former things have passed away. Great losses are finally redeemed. The older you get, this will be true for all of us, the more people you're going to long to see. The more memorial services that we go to, the more people I'm going to long to see. The more people I'm going to miss. Because they're not here with me. But to say what I said earlier, it doesn't end relationships. It just delays them. So just use your imagination. We're going to sing that just in a moment. Imagine the moments when you first moments in heaven. What's that going to be like? Beautiful song we sang. If we see Jesus face to face. The testimony of Nina said that. And that was just um, amazing. I'm going to see Jesus face to face. I'm going to see my, my dad, my mom, my daughter going to see babies maybe that I miscarried. I believe you'll see them face to face. John 14, verse 6, I say this for those listening, you know, on social media. Um, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father, that would be in heaven, except through me. He called himself the door. Jesus is the promise to this life, my friends, and really he is our only hope. He is our only hope. Amen. Jesus, thank you for this amazing truth. Not the message, not the preacher, but the fact that we hang on to this hope of heaven. Father, we pray that life never hypnotizes us into a place where we don't keep this before us. God, we pray is always in front of us. We pray it becomes our motivation, it becomes, it becomes our hope, what we cling to. It, we pray that this hope of heaven causes us to live right and pure on earth because we know someday that's where we're going. And what we do now impacts that. So Father, I just pray if somebody here or somebody's listening who has never asked Jesus Christ to be their Savior, this is simple. Just like the thief on the cross, he just reached out, remember me in paradise. Reach out yourself to Jesus right now and say, remember me, God. When I die, I want to be in your presence. I want to be in paradise with you. It's simple. He looks at a heart that is broken and a heart that's just reaching out. He's not looking for moral reform, ethical reform. And changing comes later, and he can do that in your life. That's his job, not ours. But just reach out to him, and he'll reach right back and bring you into the family of God. Father, bless the word of God in our hearts now, and 
the rest of our short time here together this morning.